So we'll uh, get started. Uh, the first announcement is that I've uploaded quiz one on uh, Carmen. I'm not sure, did you guys get any notification or? Okay, perfect. So the quiz one is on Carmen. Uh, I think the due date is next week, Wednesday or Thursday midnight. Uh, you will have two attempts to complete the quiz. Uh, so even if you make a mistake in the first attempt, you will have an option to go back and correct those mistakes. But the average of the two scores will be counted towards the final grade of the course. Um, so the first quiz is based on the lectures one to four that we just completed. Um, so it's on linear algebra and chain rule and Taylor series and all that stuff. So just take a look at the quiz. Do not start the quiz until you are in a position to spend one hour trying to finish the quiz. So, uh, but you can pick whatever time slot you want to do the quiz. You can do it even at night or whenever your brain is at its peak performance. Uh, many a times, uh, this is not the peak performance of the brain for many students as well as faculty. Uh, but uh, you can pick whatever time slot works for you. Um, the entire quiz needs to be completed within the one hour window. So as soon as you start, the timer will start for the quiz. And so it will end at the end of 60 minutes. Uh, anyways, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me after the lecture and then we can discuss about it. Uh, in the previous, uh, so, so far what we have done is we have covered all the basics, uh, like all the basic mathematical prerequisites for this class, what all things we will need uh, in order to understand the rest of the subject matter. Uh, now we are going to talk for the next three or four lectures, we'll talk about control design techniques which is how exactly, so you have a complex systems, you want to make it autonomous. How do you design the logic that is going to go into the controller uh, in order to make it autonomous, in order to make it work completely on its own? Now, of course, control design is a very, very huge field in itself. Um, there are seven or eight different ways by which controllers are designed. So of course, I'm not going to cover in the four lectures, I'm not going to cover all the different advanced techniques that people teach in a whole bunch of courses in this particular university. Uh, but I will allude to all those courses as and when I'm talking about it, so that if you are interested in knowing more about control design, you can actually go ahead and take those courses in your future coursework and be acquainted with how exactly the controllers, controllers are designed for different types of complex systems. Now, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is give you an overview of how different control uh, algorithms are designed uh, through examples. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we will jump into statistics and probability and then we'll talk about probability and uh, after that we'll talk about attack detection. So let's talk about control system design. So remember, uh, this is the figure you should have in mind. I have a reference it goes to a controller it goes to the actuator It goes to the sensor and the controller gets from sensor, the controller gets the information. So reference is the input from the user. The user could be you, me, some operator, a university and so on. So they are the reference provider. So somebody, some facilities management guy said that the thermostat of this room has to be at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the reference. The controller takes as input what the reference is and what the actual temperature is, which is measured by the thermostat sensor right there. Uh, and then it translates into an actuator signal. And the actuator is the air handling unit somewhere up uh, in this uh, above the ceiling. And the actuator decides how much cold air to send to the room. And there is room somewhere here, which is where all the cold air, hot air, all of that is. Uh, coming in and changing the temperature of the room. So this is roughly how most autonomous systems are designed. Now, of course, a large autonomous system will have 
thousands or hundreds and thousands of these each individual feedback loops, each of which is governed by reference given from some other subsystem. So some other subsystem gives the reference to the specific controller, which then acts on an actuator, and the sensor senses what the actuator is doing, and then sends the feedback to the controller. And many a times, within this particular block, we will also add a computing block, which is going to do all the attack detection and attack mitigation and the controller design and all that stuff in this particular block. Okay, so right now we are just talking about when there is no computing within that block, there's only a controller and we need to figure out what exactly should control design look like in order to get the desired uh, output. And the desired output is this output should track reference. So whatever reference signal I have given, the output should be tracking that reference signal. Okay. So in order to uh, do the control system design, uh, we need to first understand how exactly to model the control system. Okay. And there are many modeling paradigms of control system. You can model it in continuous time. You can model it in discrete time. You can model it in Laplace domain uh, as an ODE, ordinary differential equation. You can uh, use state space model. You can use single input, single output model. You can use multi input, multi output model, and so on and so forth. So there are like a whole bunch of uh, techniques that people have developed over the past 150 or so years on how the control system should be, uh, should be modeled. So we are going to use the most general state space model. The reason it is most general is because, uh, and also discrete time. So we'll use discrete time state space model uh, for nonlinear control system. So we'll use this particular model for the rest of this semester. And the reason why this model is important is because most of the control systems you would encounter would satisfy this state space model that we are going to talk about. Now, of course, there are some unique situations where they, those modeling assumptions will not be satisfied. Um, but we will not consider those uh, unique cases within this particular course. And I'll talk to you about what exactly those unique cases are. <clears throat> okay, so in the state space model, we have something called the state of the system, which is typically denoted by XT. Then we have control input, which is denoted by UT. And then we have observation. which is denoted by yt, and we will have noise, which will be denoted by wt or vt. So xt will be in rn, ut will be in rm, yt will be in r p and this will also be in some space i don't know r q and there are two noises uh, actuation noise and the sensing noise okay so actuation noise is wt sensing noise is vt And then there is a state evolution equation, xt plus 1 equals to f of xt ut wt, and then uh, the observation equation.
which is y t equals to g of x t v t. And then there is control policy which is u t equals to gamma t of y 1, y 2, all the of the y t. Okay, so that is roughly what the overall modeling paradigm is. I'll pause here for questions. How many of you have seen this before, this modeling technique? Few of you, okay. So let's try to understand, let's try to unpack what exactly these things mean. So every system has a state, there are some control inputs, then you have observations, you might have some noise, sometimes you have noise, sometimes you don't. Most of the situations you have noise, so most real systems will have noises, but sometimes the noise is so small that you can just kind of ignore it, just think that the system has no noise. Uh, the state seems to evolve, the observation is a function of state and some noise that might appear in the sensor, that gives you the observation. And then you have a control policy that takes the sequence of observation and figures out how to act in the next time step, in the current time step, okay? So what is the definition of state? So state are set of variables that uh, that can be used to predict itself in the future using the knowledge of control inputs. Okay, so coming back to this particular equation, my xt is the state, it's the set of variables that if I know what ut is, of course I will never be able to observe the noise. Um, so if I know what xt is and I know what ut will be, I mean what ut I'm going to apply, I can actually predict itself, I can predict the next set of variables uh, in the future. So that's what the state is. The control is of course the action that you are taking. So uh, right, so uh, observation is what the information you are getting from the sensor. So I'm not going to write about the control and observation. I think the state is the most important thing. But, uh, but so control is something which is easy to understand. This is how you are acting on the system. Observation is something which is again a bit complicated, so it is 
things that you are observing from the sensors, yt is the set of quantity set of variables that you are observing from the sensor, but it's also something that is needed to, to do the performance evaluation, how well you are doing, okay? So if you don't have enough sensors to assess how well you are doing, how well your system is running, then you will have to add more sensors so that you are able to come up with a reliable estimate of how well you are doing. And so again, all of these terms are something that will become clearer and clearer as we come up with concrete examples. And then noise is something that you don't really observe. You can't really see or feel uh, that. Uh, it's just something that's present, inherently present in the system. Okay, so let's look at an example. Let's look at this room. So my system is this room. What is the state of the What is the state of this room? What is the quantity that is of interest to us? Well, the temperature of this room is of interest to us. So the state here is the temperature of the room. Now you can imagine that this room is a three dimensional space, right? So for each point in this room, you have a temperature reading. So there is a temperature reading here and there is a temperature reading here. And the two temperature may or may not be equal. To give you an example, the, the cold air vent is right here. So if somebody is sitting underneath it, which is you, you're getting a lot of cold air. But I'm standing here and I'm not getting any cold air, okay? So the temperature here is different from the temperature right under the vent. So technically speaking, this temperature of the room, I'm, I'm, I'm clubbing the temperature as if the temperature is of like a single point, but actually this room is not a single point, it's a collection of points. So this is actually, so we'll, we'll get to it in a bit, but this xt, you can view xt, you can think of xt both as a temperature of a specific point in the room, you can pick that as a reference point. So let's say where this camera is, that's the reference point and we are interested in the temperature at that particular point, okay? So you can think of temperature as the temperature of a very specific reference point in the room. What is the control here? It's the position of air handling unit. Position of, I don't know, the vent, not the vent. Uh, so the air handling unit has, uh, it basically figures out how much, how much air to pump into the room. So I'm trying to figure out how to write it as the... Position of the sensor? Not the position, that's not the control. The control is what signal goes into the air handling unit. Um, which is, let's say, the air flow. Air flow from... Air handling unit, AHU. Okay, so there is some AHU in uh, somewhere above the uh, ceiling and that's figuring out, that has a damper and the damper is figuring out how much cold air to pump into this particular room. So that's the control input, UT, which is controlling the air flow at AHU. What is the observation? What sensor do we have and where are we observing the, the sensor? Like what exactly are we observing? So well, we have a temperature sensor. The temperature sensor happens to be the back of the room. So there's only one temperature sensor. That temperature sensor is in the back of the room close to the door. Okay, so this is the thermostat temperature sensor. And what's the actuation noise? What is the source of noise in this room? What is the source of, so this is the temperature of the room. And remember the temperature of the room is at a specific reference point. So we have said that this camera is a reference point. Wherever the camera is, that's my reference point. So I'm measuring the temperature at where the camera is. 
which depends on, of course, how much uh, air flow is coming through the air handling unit. That's the part that we can actively control. But then there is this noise term that is influencing the temperature, but it's something that we don't quite know, like we cannot measure it. So can someone give me examples of noise in this room? Yes. Uh, no, that would be error, but not a noise. That's an error. The yes. Sensor, the of the sensor. That's uh, that's observation noise. That's VT. Let let me write actuation noise and observation noise separately. So that is the temperature sensor noise. So sensor noise. So there are temperature fluctuations and that's adding to the sensor noise, observation noise. Any other source of observation noise? Well, okay, so yeah, you wanted to say something, yeah. Just talk, talk about the single point on camera, right? Right. Maybe the camera heat. The camera heat, okay. So yeah, the camera is doing some processing, so it's heating up, so there is camera heat. What else? What else is noise in this room? Number of people. Number of people. We are all noise in this room, okay? <laughs> and we are causing noise in this room. <laughs> Number of people. We are all emitting heat into this room. Anything else that's emitting heat into this room? The computer right here, okay? So computer heat. Anything else that's adding heat into this room or extracting heat outside this room? When the door opens. With the door open, that's right. So opening and closing of door. Of course, there could be also gaps in the door and so the air could flow in and out of that particular, those gaps. Anything else? Lights. lights. Okay, so lights are also changing the temperature of the, changing the temperature, adding heat into this room. Anything else? The walls. Okay, so many of you who live in apartment, if your wall is exposed to the outside um, weather, then in the winter those walls become very cold and they are also trying to extract heat out of the house. Okay, so wall, all of those things are adding to the actuation noise. So these are the noise that, yeah, if you put in a lot of effort, you can probably model it, you can probably calculate it, but we don't want to put in that much amount of effort to figure out how many people are in the room and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and how much heat camera is emitting, how much heat computer is emitting. So we kind of club all of them together into noise. Okay, so that's my WT. And remember that right now there is this class going on and so the camera, the computer, the people, they're all kind of emitting the same amount of heat energy into the system. But the class will end and then we will all go out. So the heat will go down very significantly. And then the new set of people will come in. Let's say there is the next class with 40 people inside this room. So all the 40 people will enter the room and then again the heat emission will rise quite significantly. So the noise is never static. So noise can change with time. So for the next 40 minutes, the noise is static. You have a constant noise. Then the noise goes down, then the noise goes up, and then there is constant noise. But noise continues to change every minute. Sometimes noise could also be introduced due to the outside weather. So in the case of this room, of course this room is not exposed to the outside walls, but sometimes rooms are exposed to the outside walls and as the outside temperature goes up and down, uh, the amount of noise also goes up and down. So anyways, those are all the source of actuation noise. In this case, the observation noise is a single noise which is the thermal noise of the sensor. But there's also a very uh, important thing. So remember, XT is the temperature at the point where the camera is 
yt is the measurement at the back of the room. Okay? And there might be some, uh, uh, for the purpose of how much do you think will be the difference in xt and yt? Let's assume that vt is zero. Let's assume that there is no thermal noise. There's no sensor noise. And let's assume the door is sealed so no cold air is coming from out to the room or no cold air is leaving the room and moving outside the room. How much is the difference between xt and yt? How much is the difference between the temperature which is at a point above the camera and the temperature which is at the sensor, thermostat sensor? What should be the difference? What, what, how much is the difference? Assuming there's no temperature gradient, it should be zero. Right. Assuming there is no temperature gradient, it should be zero. So xt and yt should be kind of sort of similar. Now, of course, there is this room. I am moving around. You guys are moving around. There is a lot of airflow happening. So kind of sort of appropriate mixing is happening inside the room. As a result of which, I don't really anticipate too much temperature gradient between where the our reference point for the temperature is and where the temperature is actually being measured. So I'm going to assume that xt and yt for all practical purposes are equal, okay? But of course, in, in reality, sometimes that may not be the case and I'll give you a specific example. In aircraft engine, the fuel is burned in the burner, okay? But the temperature cannot be measured there because the temperature there, are, there is of the order of you know, 2000 degrees Celsius, 1500 degrees Celsius and so on. So you actually measure the temperature closer to the exhaust, where the temperature is of the order of 800 degrees Celsius, 900 degrees Celsius, where you can actually have a sen temperature sensor which can measure the temperature. So even though you want to know how much fuel is injected at the burner level, there is actually no way to know how much fuel is going to, how much fuel is getting injected. You can only know it at the exhaust. You cannot know it before that. And so that's an example where you want to measure the state, but actually you can't measure the state. There's no matter, that no matter how much technology you develop, you won't be able to do it. So you have to do it much, much downstream and then figure out what the temperature at the burner stage is like, depending on a lot of other physical equations. That is also a situation when, when you look at an aircraft engine or when you look at anything related to fluid dynamics, uh, many of this state equation, observation equation and control policy, all of this will not really work. As we have modeled it, you need to model it using what is known as partial differential equation. And the way those modeling paradigms work is quite different from the way we are introducing it. So anyways, uh, those are the kind of systems we will not really study in this particular class because those require much more advanced concepts and uh, techniques. Uh, we are only looking at simple systems like this room uh, and simple systems like a car, like a vehicle. So let's do another exercise. So we have looked at how to do the system, like how do we, how do we identify what the state is, what the control is, what the observation is what the actuation noise is and what the observation noise is. We are not looking at F and G. So for the purpose of this course, we will assume that F and G is given to us by someone else. Uh, and that's because we don't have time to do the modeling in this class. But F and G, how to determine F and G? It has been part of your physics class, chemistry class and so on. Um, if you take a class in biology, they will also teach you how exactly uh, you know, the insulin influences the blood sugar and how pacemaker influences the movement of heart, the pumping of heart and so on. So if you look at some of those courses, they are the ones who are actually identifying what this function F and G looks like. In this course, F and G will be given to us. But if you look at any modeling class or if you look at feedback controls class or you take any advanced courses in fluid, fluid dynamics or uh, aircraft dynamics or I don't know some of these dynamical systems chemical dynamics class you will actually learn how to derive this F and G. Um, in the case of this room by the way this this room thing uh, this F and G gets determined by a class in thermodynamics so I don't know has any one of you taken class in thermodynamics? No? So if you take a if you go to mechanical and aerospace engineering they will have a class in thermodynamics and they actually worry about 
they actually figure out what this FNG looks like for the case of uh, heat injection in a room sort of setting. So let's look at, let's do the same exercise, but now for a car, okay? So we'll figure out what the state of the car is, what the control input to the car is, what the observation of the car is, what the actuation noise and observation noise is. Oh, one question. Uh, remember that one of the key requirements for observation is you should be able to know how well you are doing, right? So how do we know how well we are doing? whether we are tracking the 72 degrees Fahrenheit temperature or not, inside at the camera level, right? So the university decides that at the camera, the temperature should be 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we said that there is no temperature gradient in the room, so whatever temperature is there at the camera is also reflected at the thermostat. We have a sensor there, and based on the sensor reading, we know what the temperature is, and based on that temperature, we know how well we are doing, how close we are to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, or how far we are from 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So anyways, the observation is good enough for us to control the system, because we know how well we are doing, based on the reading. Okay, so let's look at a car. What is the state of the car? How many of you drive a car? Okay, many of you. So you should know what the states of the car is. If you have a valid license, then you should know it. If you don't know it, too bad. Your license will get revoked. <laughs> What's the state of the car? Yes. Well, you can park, you can be accelerating, right. you can be reversing, you can be in neutral, any of those really. Uh, but what you are talking about is very binary in nature. Are you parked or not parked? Yeah. But we need to get to a more, more uh, real numbers. Like what are the real numbers that provides you with the state of the car? Assuming 2D coordinate system, x, y, x dot, y dot, and okay. theta, theta. Right. Uh, so position, I guess let me call it GPS position. And then velocity. What else? Orientation. Orientation. Orientation is what is the angle of the car. But orientation with respect to what? It could be with respect to the x-axis, y-axis. I mean, if you're assuming just 2D. So I'm, I'm driving my vehicle on a highway. What does orientation mean? So it could be with respect to the heading of the vehicle. Itself. Heading of the vehicle, yeah. with respect to the center of the lane. And then heading. So orientation is how, how, how the car's body is, what the car body angle is with respect to the center of the lane. And then heading is how your tires are, like what's the position of your tires, or what's the angle of the tires with respect to the car's center. So that's heading. Anything else? Anything else that's part of the state of the vehicle? Are we talking inside of the car? Or it could be outside of the car also. Because remember, the state is supposed to like predict itself based on the actuation noise and whatever. Xt plus one should be equal to Xt, Ut, and Wt. So it could be inside the vehicle, it could be outside the vehicle. And it really depends, you know, how you are modeling it. So sometimes outside the vehicle could also be part of the state of the system.
Anybody drives a manual car here? No? One. So you should know. Gear, yeah. So gear is another state of the system. In the automatic car, the state transition happens automatically according to some logic inside the car. But in uh, manual, you have to do it manually. You have to change the gear manually. So in automatic car, gear is a state. In manual, it's actually an action because you get to decide what gear you want to pick at a specific point of time. Okay, so sometimes the state could also be include uh, distance to the vehicle in front. Or side of the uh, of the your vehicle. So what's the distance to the vehicle on this side? What's the distance to the vehicle in front? And then it could also be distance to center of the lane. So if you know of this feature called lane keeping assist, the lane keeping assist is always trying to drive the car so that it follows the center of the lane. The distance to the center of the lane is also a state of the system, depending on if you are thinking about lane keeping assist in an automatic car. <clears throat> Yeah, you can have distance to the divider, distance to the traf distance to the stop sign. Distance to the traffic light. Stop sign and so on. So you know you really have a very large number of states when you are driving a vehicle. And the funny thing is that as human beings, we are actually consuming all this information. We are, we are actually measuring all of this and figuring out how to drive. So that's my state. Let's, let's just enumerate what the action is. So what are the actions in the vehicle, in the automatic vehicle? We pretty much have only two actions. Either we accelerate or we brake. And then there is steering. So acceleration and brake is basically whether your acceleration is positive or negative. So negative acceleration is basically braking. So you have two actuators, but actually they are controlling a single quantity, which is the acceleration of the vehicle, whether acceleration is positive or negative. And then we, of course, don't use the gear that much. Of course, there is a reverse gear and neutral and so on and so forth. But uh, as far as driving in for forward direction is concerned, we don't really actively control the gear. But in manual car, gear is also a control variable. And in manual car, clutch is also a control variable, which is different from acceleration. <clears throat> and uh, anything else that, or oh, steering. Steering is, of course, a control variable as well. So in a car, there are like three, four control variables, depending on what car you are driving. What about observations? What kind of observations are we making when we are driving a car? Let's say you are the person, you are, you are the controller in the car. What observations are you making in the car? What is this YT? <clears throat> so you look at the car's dashboard, you get a bunch of readings, right? You get engine RPM, which I kind of ignore it while I'm driving. I don't care what the engine RPM is, but I'm sure somebody cares about it. Um, I look at uh, the velocity, which I really care because I want to be, I don't want to take law in my own hands. Uh, I want to be, uh, I want to meet the speed limit guidelines. So I look at the, the uh, speedometer. Um, and then uh, I have visual information about what's happening on the road, okay? So in some sense, I'm actually not, uh, measuring any of this exactly. So this is my XT. Remember, this is my XT. But actually, my observation, which is from my visual thing, I'm not measuring XT exactly. I'm not measuring distance to the vehicle in front in meters. 
All I know is, is it comfortable distance or is it not comfortable distance? If it is not comfortable distance, I'll slow down. If it is comfortable distance, I'll be speeding up or I'll be coasting. Right? So in some sense, the observation is not very... Uh, uh, when I'm driving the vehicle, the observation I'm making is visual in nature. I mean, there are some numerical observation I can make because my, I have sensors and the sensors give me that information. But most of the observation that I'm making about each of these quantities is not exact in nature at all. But it is an approximation. And that approximation is measured by how much noise there is. Now, if I'm, a, if I'm, if I'm driving after drinking alcohol, or if I'm driving after taking drugs, then this VT is very, very large, okay? And that's why we get into accidents, okay? But, uh, but, but, but otherwise, the VT is very small. VT is reasonable, within reasonable bounds that we are able to drive our cars uh, successfully without any problem. What about noises? What is WT and VT here? What are the noises? What are the things within the car that we don't... that's affecting the evolution of the state, but we are not really measuring it? What is the noise that the car gets subjected to? Which we don't measure, but it is affecting the vehicle performance. Yes? Could it possibly be like water conditions on the road? Weather conditions on the road. So you, your road could, could be slippery, it could have a water, it could be raining, it could be, there could be wind, there could be crosswind, there could be wind coming from front. Uh, sometimes you could have a truck going in front of you, and that used to be my money-saving tactic when I was a graduate student. So I'll drive behind the truck, so that way my fuel efficiency will go from 30 miles per gallon to 35 miles per gallon. Okay, so you could use some of that noise to your advantage. Now I don't do that. <laughs> uh, but uh, at some point of time I used to do that. Okay, uh, when I was hardcore optimizer, that's how I used to optimize my cost of driving the vehicle. But anyways, uh, uh, so that's noise. Uh, you could have a vehicle that is in this lane, but it just came suddenly in front of your lane. Okay, so it did not give you that information up front. It just came into your lane. So that's a noise onto the system. And you suddenly have to break. You suddenly have to change your control action in order to address that noise. Okay. Um, what is the other noise that we have? Uh, air conditioning system inside the vehicle. So you turn on the knob or, you know, let's say the... Let's say you set the temperature, the thermostat within the vehicle at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and suddenly it started raining, and then suddenly it became sunny. So in both these situations, the overall thermal comfort of the car, the algorithm will make some changes to how, the th how to maintain that 75 degrees Fahrenheit temperature, and the air conditioning system is actually coupled to the same engine. So now your engine's performance is going to change depending on how different your air conditioning requirements are, which depends on the weather again. So all of those are, and that air conditioning system performance is then going to affect your state of the, the state evolution of the system. So those are all noises on the car. Uh, if you look at a autonomous vehicle, about 10 to 15 percent of the energy consumption of autonomous vehicle is actually due to the computing systems on board. So even the computing systems, how much calculations it is doing, how much energy that calculation is consuming, all of that is actually coming out of the engine. So that also influences the uh, state evolution of the vehicle. So all of those is uh, part of WT. And observation noise we have already talked about, which is you know, how we are perceiving. And of course, observation noise would change. One of the major reasons why autonomous vehicles are still not on the road is because we don't quite know what the observation noise of vehicles are going to be like. So you see our eyes, are so perfect that if there is a deer on the road, we will be able to see that there is a deer on the road and we'll stop our vehicle. Uh, I have never seen a python in my life, but if there is a python on the road, I will be able to stop my vehicle. The problem with autonomous vehicles camera is that it needs to know that there is something called a python and it needs to have seen millions of images of python before it can predict that, look, there is a python on the road and I need to stop my vehicle. So this VT, in the case of autonomous vehicle is too high, very high, this noise, observation noise. 
because the camera needs to see everything perfectly all the time. And that's just not possible because we don't have enough data. So I remember going to a conference where somebody was telling us about the autonomous vehicle test bed that they were developing. And there is a bike on the road, and there is a car on the road, and the biker is coming from the, uh, from the front, uh, and the camera is moving on the road. And from some angles, the camera detects that there is a biker on the road, and from some other angles, it detects that there is no biker on the road. Now imagine from a camera's perspective, let's say you are this controller and you are being told there is a biker, there is a biker, there is no biker, there is no biker, there is a biker. Which one are you going to trust? Do you know if there is a biker or you know that there is no biker? Unfortunately, there is no way to create trust in that particular system. That creates the big issue with observation noise. So depending on the sensor, so if the sensors are your eyes, your brain is extremely developed to know whether there is a biker or no biker and how far the biker is. Is it comfortable distance or not so comfortable distance? But if it is a camera or if it is a LiDAR, it becomes fairly difficult. It's also the case that your eyes, it's very difficult to fool your eyes. It's very easy to fool a radar or a camera because you can have some electromagnetic sensor or radiation or something like that and you can fool them. A bug splatter can fool the camera because if a bug dies on the camera lens itself, uh, the camera's reading is gonna be all garbage. So all of that can fool the camera, but your eyes will not get, I don't know, your eyes will start watering and then you will be fine all over again. You can start measuring everything perfectly. So anyways, we have developed quite a good observation uh, sensor but uh, engineered systems may or may not have those many uh, good observation sensors and they are all susceptible to cyber attacks, which we will study in the course. Actually, that will be uh, many of the people, in fact, I remember in the last, last offering of this course, uh, there were about maybe 18 or so people and eight of those people came up with cyber attacks on autonomous vehicles as their course project. That was their course project. So I was like, how, is, how are autonomous vehicles going to run on the road if there are so many attack surfaces? While on humans, there are hardly any, like you, I have to physically attack you to influence your driving behavior. Uh, you cannot do a cyber attack and influence your driving behavior. Anyway, so that's something we need to worry about it. And the control policy is uh, what we will be discussing uh, in the subsequent classes, but I'll give you broad categories of control policy designs. Uh, but any questions so far uh, before we jump on to control policy? Yes, please. If you have, uh, like, if your car's in need of maintenance, like, let's say there's some play in your brake pedal, mm -hmm. is that, like, an intrinsic part of the system now because it's always like that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So basically, there is some noise that was not there earlier, but the new noise got added. Uh, if, if you have some error in the brake pedal or if there is some issue with that, then that new noise gets added. Those are... So that's the whole uh, discussion between fault and attack. So if this is something that somebody intentionally added into your vehicle, then of course it's an attack on your vehicle. Uh, if it is something that happens, the failures that typically happens after regular wear and tear of the vehicle, then it's a fault. But it is, both of them are basically noise on the system. They are influencing the transition dynamics of the state of the system. <coughs> Any other question? Uh, will we discuss modeling errors and whether it's an actually an attack? Like for example, how do you distinguish whether it's uh, a modeling error or it's actually? Right. So uh, you know, typically modeling errors are very uh, so systems that are in production, uh, there would hardly be. I mean, there would be modeling errors, but they would be uh, they would be so small that you can ignore them. But if you have major modeling errors. Uh, that could only happen if there is a major fault that you did not account for. And I'm trying to think of what could be a major fault that you did not, okay, there is an example. So uh, there was a Airbus flight that was going from Brazil to France, I think. I think Rio to Paris or something like that. It was an Air France flight, I think. And it was an Airbus flight or maybe a Boeing, I don't know, but it was some aircraft, some commercial aircraft. It was carrying 250 or so passengers, 
and it was flying at night and there was there were uh, some severe thunderstorm while the flight was going up anyways the flight went up at 30 35000 feet and some of the pitot tubes so you know what pitot tubes are so pitot tubes are outside the flight and they have a nozzle and the air comes in through the nozzle and then they it measures the air speed the relative air speed with, between the flight and the air so what happened in the pitot tubes was there were some ice crystal deposition. So you see what happened was when it rained, the water went into the pitot tubes and then when it went to 30,000 feet at minus 50 degrees Celsius, those, those uh, water droplets became ice crystals and it blocked the pitot tube. And now whatever information was going into the aircraft's engine where the pilot is looking at the indicators, it's basically saying that there is no air flow. Uh, well, it didn't say that there is no airflow. What it said was that the, the heading of the aircraft is, is whatever, some, I don't know, it's going down, the aircraft is going down or something like that, okay? So it gave some wrong information to the pilot. So the pilot said, oh, if the aircraft is going down, I need to pull up the aircraft. So the pilot pulled up the aircraft. Now, the actual aircraft is doing completely fine, but because the pilot pulled up the aircraft, the, the, the aircraft started going all the way to 40,000 feet, 45,000 feet. After that, it went into a deep stall and went into the ocean and everyone died. So that's a situation where you had an unmodeled error. Nobody thought that pitot tubes could have ice deposition or they might have thought about some sort of crystal deposition, but not the one that actually happened on that particular night in the aircraft. So those are the kind of situations where you could have unmodeled uh, thing, but that was actually unmodeled here at the observation level. It was an observation noise, not an actuation noise. But because the wrong information was fed to the pilot, the pilot took some action. So remember, your action is a function of the observations. So the, you have wrong observation, you took wrong actions, and then the system collapsed. Okay, so that could happen uh, very much. and. Uh, in this case, it's not an attack, it's actually a fault because it was not intentional in nature. Uh, however, uh, when, when you start designing, when you get into these safety critical control systems, you'll have to follow a lot of rules and regulations uh, so as to make sure that you don't make any of the errors here. And then a new, new uh, accident happens and then they go back and add another rule in the rule book or another five rules in the rule book and now you have to check for all those uh, different errors that could potentially happen. Um, so I don't have much time, so I'm going to end the class today here. Um, we are going to talk about uh, different control design techniques. So, so we talked about the state, observation, and control action, and noise, and all that stuff. What I'm going to talk about is how is this gamma T design, okay, in the subsequent classes. So, so far we learned about this F, we learned about G, um, what I have mentioned so far is F and G is subject, like how F gets decided and how G gets decided, it's all subject of other classes, so we are not going to talk about it here. We will talk about how gamma T gets decided in a variety of different uh, problems uh, in the coming three or four lectures, and then we'll talk about statistics. So thank you so much. Uh, I'll see you guys on Friday. And quiz one is uh, on Carmen, so please keep that in mind. <laughs>